Mangla. Good morning. My name is Poojita, and today we'll be talking about internet governance. So the question today is: Can the internet really be governed? Internet na govern maada ke sadhya idya. So the answer to this question is both yes as well as no. So what is internet governance? Internet governance and re developing certain rules and regulations and policies uh, that shape the evolution and use of the internet. Internet na hege use marbe ko anadur bage. When you basically develop rules and policies and norms, the entire thing is called as internet governance. As we all know, internet na kandir the dauru US. So almost 1998, Tanka, the US was in charge of basically governing the internet. In 1998, there was an organization that was established, which was called as ICANN. Andre, it stands for Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers. E ICANN organization in Martitu, they basically were in charge of governing the internet through domain names and IP addresses. As you all know, two computers on the internet cannot have the same IP address, so they were basically in charge of giving unique IP addresses and domain names. Can you have two websites called Facebook.com? No. So that is why they were in charge of giving unique domain names to all the web pages on the internet. So this was only a part of internet governance. When we talk about internet governance, because of the sheer size of the internet, it is made up of thousands and millions of networks. Because of the number of users on the internet, because of the amount of content that is being generated on the internet, internet governance is a very very tough job. And when I say internet governance to different people, it means different things. When I when telecommunication experts talk about internet governance, they basically deal with analog transmission hegag beko, digital transmission hegag beko. So they basically deal only with that part of internet governance. Computer specialists and the people like us for computer engineers, whenever we think of internet governance, it is mainly to do with applications. As to how to develop better programs on the internet using XML and Java platforms. When we talk about communication specialists, they are more bothered about internet governance in the form of communication routers, so hubs, so switches. So even Allah use smart condo. What what how to basically achieve accuracy and uh, speed of de uh, delivery in the internet? Another bagge they are more concerned. When you talk about human rights. And civil society, civil societies, and it is basically citizens of a country. So when we use internet, we are more concerned about our freedom of speech and expression, and also our privacy rights. So when it comes to lawyers, what do they want? To do with internet governance, they are basically more concerned with lawmaking process, legislation, jurisdiction, and if there are any disputes, then resolving such disputes. So they are bothered about that component of the internet governance. And what about politicians? Now you see Twitter handles. Prime Minister Narendra Modi has a Twitter handle. The Congress, the BJP institutions have a Twitter handle. So politicians' internet governance. How do they view internet governance? They they basically. Deal with medias and issues in their electorate. So, to different people, internet governance means different things. So, now when we come to governance of the internet, it can be categorized into four major areas. So, the first one is infrastructure and standardization. So, if I have a Mobile phone that is of a different hardware and software specification. For example, if I am going to use a mobile phone that is manufactured by by Apple, and if you are using a mobile phone that basically runs on an Android operating system, are we able to send messages to each other over the internet or use WhatsApp and still receive those messages? Yes. Now, how is this possible? This is possible because there is some kind of standardization at both the hardware as well as the software level. 
available so internet as you know is made up of diversified networks eshtone networks irutha eshtone computers irutha all of which are made uh, using different hardware and basically run different software so we need to achieve some kind of standardization of this hardware and software infrastructure so that we are able to communicate using the internet now this includes tel uh, telecommunication infrastructure various protocols such as tcp ip internet service providers now who are these isps or internet service providers these are the people or companies who basically give access to the internet to the customers web standards internet security standards encryption standards so we need some standardization in all these areas so uh, where we can actually send and receive information through the internet now the second aspect of governance of internet is legal so we always talk about trademarks and patents and intellectual property rights cyber crimes jurisdiction so the internet is used for a vast number of things it has the power to basically affect every aspect of the human life today so idanalla when we talk about legal aspects you basically are dealing with cyber crimes and trademarks and patents and intellectual property rights all these come under the legal aspects now economic uh, today we are able to sit in our houses do online banking transactions we are able to shop using websites such as flipkart and amazon so all those kind of applications come under the economic part of the governance of the internet and what about development development basically refers to transfer of technology one country li iro antha technology na innond country ge for its economic and social development ge uh, you transfer it so it can benefit from this technology is basically referred to as transfer of technology so the united nations in uh, 2005 they had a summit which was called as WSIS which stands for World Summit on Information Society so they came to a conclusion that uh, this information knowledge and communication technology must be accessible to all the countries so they can use it for various programs such as poverty alleviation or they could use it for other social and economic developments so when we talk about development we are basically talking about transfer of technologies to developing nations um the next we'll talk about security aspect in e governance now what is e governance e governance is a method in which the government adopts ict ict and the information and communication technology to basically deliver all the government services to the doorstep of the citizens so we are using computers and networks so that citizens can basically uh, basically access this also get advantages of different government services now uh, some of the examples such as we are of e governance today you have aadhar and you have a digital locker you have national optical fiber network this national optical fiber network is basically used to connect all the panchayats there are about 25000 panchayats across india and uh, it is basically used to connect all these panchayats using a, a broadband network uh you have your caste and income certificates that are generated and can be accessed online you have your national scholarship portal where you're able to upload your information and um, the amount directly gets uh, uh, uh di directly gets transact uh, transacted into your accounts so all of this are e governance initiatives the government has basically made it quite simple now why do you need to secure this e governance why do you need to make sure this e governance is secured from threats and vulnerabilities and viruses and trojans because whenever you take government e governance projects uh, it involves a large amount of personal data you have uh, birth certificates birth information death information you have land records you have licenses so all kinds of important information is basically there in a government server so and this information if given out to the public or if it is accessed by unauthorized people then it can be used for unlawful activities so it is very very important to secure every e governance project now what are the security measures that are used to secure these e governance uh, projects and what are the 
threats. Now, you know, all digital content, for example, if you take Aadhaar, now Aadhaar contains uh, digital content of millions of us. It basically contains our fingerprints, it uh, contains the iris scans, it contains all our private information that is basically stored. So there needs to be protection from tampering, vandalism and accident. Tampering, Andre, this data should not be changed or altered deliberately. Vandalism, Andre, to be, this data should not be destroyed or even accidentally deleted. So online applications, again, you basically book your tickets online, uh, whether it is bus tickets or railway tickets or air tickets, and you basically do online money transactions. So wherever money is involved, it becomes a heaven for criminals. So it is, it becomes a soft target. And also, why you need to have security measures in place because the because of the sure amount of information that is present in e-governance projects now proper tools are required uh, to secure such amount of data both at the network level as well as the host level host level and at the level of your personal computer so what are all the security measures that you adopt you have you can have a firewall you can have an antivirus uh, software running in your computer you basically need to have the latest edition of operating system that is basically installed in your computer now these are all the security measures that you can adopt at the host level at the network level so you basically have encryption standards where the information that you're trying to pass over the network is encrypted so no third party will be able to access this particular information so security need to be provided at the host computer level and then in personal computer level only there needs to be security also when this information passes through the network there needs to be security now, what are the threats? Now, threats involve scams, fooling users to give away personal and financial information, distributed denial of service. Now, what is denial of service attack? A denial of service attack basically happens when the server is uh, when the server uh, gets so much of traffic that authorized users are not able to access information. So you have automated uh, computer bots. So these bots are nothing but robo programs that repetitively execute themselves on the internet. So what do these hackers and other uh, people do? They basically use these uh, internet bots to uh, attack a server with requests, so many hundreds and millions of requests that a normal authorized employee or a customer will not be able to access that particular server. Now, this is called as distributed denial of service. The service that you get as an authorized customer or an employee is being denied to you because there is so much of unwanted traffic that is basically created at the server. Now, that is distributed denial of service. You all know what is a virus is. It basically does not allow us to carry on with the normal, normal functioning of a computer system. And what is a Trojan? Trojan is, again, a uh, malware that gives access of the computer's private information outside okay it basically allows you to access the user's system so these are all the threats that we need to keep away in order for an e-governance project to be successful now security monitoring tools so you have different tools for monitoring different kinds of uh, security the first one is vulnerability assessment so when we talk about vulnerability it means whatever are the weaknesses of our security policy that needs to be assessed so the first thing is you need to identify the vulnerabilities or the weaknesses in the network both at the network level as well as the host level once you identify the weaknesses the next is to purchase or develop security products and features which basically target those particular weaknesses and then you also of course you cannot uh, just uh, get solutions now but you also need to constantly upgrade these solutions because every day is a different scenario and then you also need to assess what the real world threat to the network assets are next is security policy development so as a company you always need to have a security policy in place so this security policy developing a security policy for any company that involves thousands of computers and thousands of employees is not an easy task nowadays you have uh, 
automated tools that can be used to develop security policies for your company. So what do these policies do? They basically give guidelines to network engineers on how to deploy solutions for all kinds of network problems. You have computers that are connected to the network. So the security policy basically tells the network engineers or guides them as to how to protect your computers when they are connected to the network. Now the next is wireless network analysis. So in regions, uh, in regions of our country where it is very, very difficult to lay physical fiber connectivity, suppose there is a hilly terrain or a rocky region where it is difficult to basically dig and lay down wires, this wireless networks becomes very, very attractive in order to pass on the benefits of e-governance to rural and remote areas. But what happens in wireless network analysis, though the solution is very simple, so wireless networks are easy to use, but when it when it comes to the security aspects, they are they do not uh, provide optimum security. The risk is always there about threats and vulnerabilities and susceptibility to penetration. So it can be easily hacked. So that is about wireless networks. Successful identity authentication. So now companies such as e-commerce companies, if you're trying to do purchase something uh, on an e-commerce uh, company and then you go to the payment gateway, so they send you a mobile pin that is used to authenticate the user. Now, such kinds of authentication is called as successful identity authentication. They need to authenticate that you are a genuine user. Okay, and there are different authentications. You have passwords and you have logins, you have mobile pins. Okay, these are the different forms of authentication. Um, now, especially authentication plays an important role, especially in government e-governance projects. So an unauthorized person does not get uh, all kinds of sensitive information that are basically stored in the government websites. Now we'll come to electronic mail. Electronic mail is the most popular aspect of the internet. We've all used uh, electronic mail. We all have an email ID, which is basically used to communicate. So how does this uh, email develop? So you all have probably seen office memos where a person who needs to pass on some information to all his colleagues or subordinates actually types a memo or writes a memo. And basically then he sends it through the attender so that that message is received by every employee in that particular office. So in order to automate the office memo, um, uh, a technical aspect which was called as the email was actually developed. So basically it is an extension of the office memo. So first what happens, an individual, he creates a message and then he specifies whom this message has to reach. Now the receiver of this message is called as the recipients. And there is an email software that is responsible for transmitting a copy of the message to each recipient. Nowadays, the electronic mail, the email is not only used to compose a message and send a message. There are so many other things that you can do using an email. For example, automated uh, complex interactions. Suppose you're out of town and you receive an email and you want them to know that you're actually out of town. So you can uh, generate an automated reply which says, OK, I'm out, out of town. I will come back on so and so day and probably get back to you. Even without login, uh, logging in into your uh, email account, you're able to generate automated responses. So the interactions have become more complex. So email is just not about composing a message and sending a message. Now let's talk about electronic mailboxes and addresses. Now what is a mailbox? Every email account is basically given a mailbox and mailbox is nothing but a passive storage area. It could be a file on a disk. So these are passive storage areas usually on the server. So whenever you try to access Gmail from your browser, so the browser acts like a client and it basically requests for the a uh, mailbox to be displayed on your computer so the server so your browser is the client and the mail server which is nothing but the gmail server acts as a server and when the authentication is successful that is when you put in your login id and your password so your browser 
sends this login ID and password to the Gmail server. And if the authentication is successful, it basically displays your mailbox on your browser screen. So the electronic mailbox, as you all know, is a private entity. OK, only you will be able to access it and uh, read the messages or uh, delete the messages and nobody else. OK, for everyone else, this uh, role is basically denied. So a person who has multiple computer accounts can have multiple mailboxes. Even today, a single user can hold different email IDs. Now, each mailbox is assigned. How do you detect uniquely a single mailbox is because of your email ID, which is basically unique. This email ID consists of two parts. The first part actually specifies a mailbox on that computer. And the second part basically specifies which computer. So if you have an email ID, which is mailbox at computer, then mailbox is that particular passive storage area on at computer is which computer this mailbox is uh, specified upon. Now, how does the mail transfer take place? For example, as a user, if I am going to compose a message, how does this message ultimately reach the recipient? First, what am I going to do? I'm going to open the software on my computer, compose a message, and I'm going to specify who the receiver of this message is. That is the recipient. The, there, is, uh, there are two email uh, softwares here two pieces of software that are basically required. One piece of software is required for me to compose the messages and for me to read the messages. That piece of software is called as the email interface program. Now, this email interface program allows me to basically type out a message, key in the a recipient's address okay and also to read the messages which are there in my inbox the other piece of software helps to remove this message that i have composed and deliver it into the mailbox of the recipient so there are two softwares here so after i finish composing a message so the email interface program what this piece of software does it it puts my message in a queue so and the email transfer program removes this particular message from the queue and basically transfers it onto the remote machine if the user if the recipient is on the same computer then the email content is basically appended to the user's mailbox if the recipient is on a remote computer okay is in a different place basically this email is sent over the internet uh, where where a copy is actually placed in the recipient's mailbox. So the recipient here can either be a local recipient or he can or she can be a remote recipient. Now, uh, this is a pictorial representation. So what rectangle that you see on the left hand side is basically the sender's computer. And the rectangle that you see on the right hand side is the recipient's computer. So as I told you on the user computer, there are two pieces of software. One is the interface, the email interface software, and this is the mail transfer program. So the email interface software allows you to compose the mail and the mail transfer program allows you to send the mail. How is the mail sent? Obviously with the use of the internet. Now this mail software, on the sender's computer, it again performs the job of putting that particular mail into the recipient's mailbox. Okay, this is a simple uh, diagram. Now, how does the email actually work? Um, so you have basically what is called as an email ID. The first part of the email ID is a username. The second part is the domain name. For example, if I have principal at sjp.in, then principal becomes the username and sjp.in becomes the domain name. So the sender composes a message and then it contacts the remote mail server. For example, imagine I'm going to use Gmail. So I open my Gmail account um, and who connects with the mail server it is your browser the browser basically acts as a client that connects to the mail server which mail server are we talking about in this example it is the gmail server so once authentication is successful it contacts the gmail server and and then again you basically send the mail to the mail server and the mail server is responsible for sending that same message to the recipient when the recipient wants to access that particular email again he or she contacts the mail server and finally the message is basically retrieved 
So this is again a step by step process. So a sender composes the mail using a mail client software. The mail client use allows the user to compose, edit, and send the mail message. After composing the mail message, the user sends it to the recipient's email address. The message propagates across the internet before it reaches the mail server of the recipient. Now, the domain name in the recipient's email address identifies the mail server, whereas the username correctly identifies which mailbox the message is to be delivered into. As I told you, uh, if there is an email ID which says principal at sjp.in, then the address of the mail server is sjp.in and the username or the mailbox name is principal. And then the recipient basically connects to the email account and basically reads the messages. So the recipient has a client mail service on the other end, but that is basically used to receive you can also save the email messages. You can also print out the email messages. And there is no direct link between the sender and the recipient. So how does the message actually reach from the sender's computer to the receiver's computer? It basically passes through a series of networks, which is called as the internet. Now, for a message to go from the sender to the receiver, you need some kind of standardization. And to achieve this standardization, you need protocols. As you all know, protocols are nothing but a set of rules. So there are different protocols that are basically used to ensure that your, that, that, uh, that your email reaches from your computer to the receiver computer. Now, what are those protocols? The first protocol that we are going to study is SMTP, which stands for Simple Mail Transfer Protocol. Now, this is the TCP IP protocol, which supports electronic mail. What is the TCP IP protocol? It is the Transmission Control Protocol, connection-oriented protocol that basically uh, uh, the TCP IP protocol allows one computer to establish connection to a network and makes sure that this connection survives. Okay, so this is the TCP protocol's main important function. It allows you uh, to connect to the network and make sure this connection is there until you basically finish your work. And the TCP IP protocol that supports the email is called as the SMTP protocol. Now, this SMTP protocol basically allows the user to basically send messages either to one recipient or more than one recipient. It allows us to send messages that not only include text, but also voice or graphics. And it also allows us to send messages to users who are outside the internet who are probably not connected to the internet now this smtp uses ascii character set so whenever you compose a message so whatever is available in the ascii character set you can basically use only that which means you probably can use only the english language to compose a message so if you want to compose a message either in Kannada or hindi then the smtp protocol needs to be replaced with some other protocol but because this supports only the ascii character set so as you all know, a mail has two parts. One is called as the header part and one is called as the content or the body part. The header part includes the address of the recipient. It includes the address of the sender. It has a time and a date stamp as to when you're sending the email, when this email is being going to be received. So all these kinds of information basically forms the header part. And the body part is the actual message content that you're basically trying to send. So the disadvantages of the SMTP protocol is that there is no acknowledgement here. So you wouldn't know that the mail that you have sent has basically reached the recipient. There is no acknowledgement that is basically sent back to you. And there is no guarantee. So if the messages uh, that travels through the network is basically lost or it is timed out or it is basically delayed, there is no guarantee that you can basically recover the lost messages. So the last two points are basically the drawbacks of the SMTP. Even though these drawbacks are present, the SMTP is one of the most widely used email protocols. Now, let's go to the post office protocol. Now, 
why is there a need for the post office protocol is because smtp is a tcp ip protocol suit it belongs to the tcp ip protocol suit now tcp is a connection oriented protocol so for example if i want to send a mail then the destination mail server should always be online to receive the mail if we are going to use the smtp protocol when we take personal computer this is not the case we can, we are always not connected to the internet because after we finish using the computer we basically shut down so that is why you cannot use the smtp protocol when the uh, mail server is not online the smtp protocol needs that the mail server at the client side at the receiving side to be always online so in many organizations what they do the mail is basically received by the smtp host and the smtp host provides a service which is called as a mail drop service okay so because the smtp host is always active or online so all the mails are basically received by this smtp host and whenever the user goes online he can retrieve all the messages in his mailbox using the post office protocol so the post office protocol is not used to basically transfer the emails it is only used to retrieve the emails from the smtp host now in order to use the post office protocol you need an additional server you need to have a mail server in addition to that you need to have a pop server so the user runs the email softwares that becomes a client of the pop server to access the contents of the mailbox so let's look at a diagram here the sending computer uses a mail transfer program to send the mail through the internet okay and this is this uh, mail is actually received by what you can see in the uh, center is basically the web server the web server along with the web server there needs to be a pop server to which the user computer basically uh, connects so that the user computer can retrieve whatever are the content, uh, contents of his or her mailbox so in addition to the web server there is also the pop server that is basically used so you have different uh, uh, um, varieties of pop like pop2 and pop3 that are basically used today the next one is imap which is basically the internet message access protocol it was developed by stanford university in 1986 so the imap is very very similar to the pop3 both work uh, the same way it is basically used by the uh, client to retrieve the mails but it gives more features than the pop so while you're trying to retrieve the mails you can also search your mailbox using certain keywords you can also choose which messages you want to be you want to download onto your machine so additional uh, features like this is available with imap whereas with pop you are only able to retrieve the new mails so pop was actually used when the internet was an expensive resource so whenever dial up connections were actually used the pop protocol was used so when you connect to the internet and use the pop all the new mails used to get downloaded into your computer you couldn't choose as to which mail you wanted to actually download if there were any uh, new mails and the ones which have not been previously downloaded only those kind of mails were actually downloaded so imap was basically an improvisation to pop it allowed you to select which messages you want to download onto your computer it allowed you to search your mails so it basically provided all such kinds of additional features but both pop as well as imap are basically used along with smtp the next is mime which stands for multi purpose internet mail extension so now smtp one of the uh, important features of smtp was that you could only use the character ascii character set to basically compose your message but if you wanted to compose your message in hindi or kannada or any other language other than english then you basically need to use mime nowadays mime actually comes inbuilt with most of uh, the email softwares but then back in those days you had to have mime to basically do it so um so now 
uh, you have Kannada characters and uh, Hindi characters, which are part of the Unicode. So ASCII is only a subset of the Unicode. So MIME is also used to exchange email messages containing non-textual data, such as graphic, sound, and multimedia messages. It allows user to basically compose messages in languages with different character sets. Um, and whenever you want to uh, send messages that does not include textual uh, messages, such as an audio file or a graphics file, then you can basically encode this file using MIME. And the, en the MIME encodes these files in a textual form, which can be sent using SMTP. So it encodes it in a format that the SMTP understands. And the recipient also needs to have MIME protocol. It needs to follow the MIME protocol in order to basically decode what you have encoded. Uh, so this is actually the last slide. So just to summarize all that we have done today, uh, from the beginning so we actually spoke about internet governance you know internet is like a vast ocean it basically cannot be governed but uh, international organizations such as ICANN which stands for internet corporation for assigned names and numbers they basically assign domain names and IP addresses so that is one form of governance we spoke about how governance is different to different kinds of people and then we spoke about what is e-governance and why we need to secure e-governance projects and um, uh, we spoke about how we need to give security at both the host level as well as the network level at the host level you need to protect your computer by upgrading to the latest operating system you need to have uh, you need to configure your firewalls you need to have an antivirus software you need to have strong passwords for authentication so these are all the things that you can do at the host level at the network level you have different encryption standards that are basically used for uh, by different software whenever you're trying to send information across the network and then we looked at what are the different uh, components uh, security monitoring tools as to how you can assess the weakness how to develop a security policy and what are the advantages and disadvantages of using a wireless network even though wireless network are very easy to deploy but security is not the main function of a wireless network and how do you ensure successful identity authentication then we spoke about the electronic mail, which is the most used application of the internet as to how you can compose a mail, how that mail is basically transferred, what are the components of an email ID, and um, how the mail can not only be transferred onto a local computer, but also to a remote user. So we spoke about two pieces of software that is used to basically compose a mail, which is the email interface program. And for that mail to actually be transferred to another computer, you use a mail transfer program. So nowadays, uh, the mail softwares that you get like Gmail or Hotmail or any kinds of mail softwares, they basically are made up of all these kinds of softwares. It has both an interface program as well as a transfer program. And then we spoke about different mail protocols, SMTP. So when do you use SMTP is when you basically using ASCII character set to compose your message. But the drawbacks of SMTP is that you don't get any acknowledgement that your message is actually delivered to the recipient. And if the messages are lost, either due to delayed messages or the timestamp um, uh, being over, then there is no guarantee that you will recover the lost messages. So then we said, spoke about the post office protocol because SMTP is connection oriented. So the destination server has to always be online for the recipient to receive the mail. So that is always not possible. Uh, so that is why you have the post office protocol where you use a POP server to basically uh, retrieve the recipient's emails. And then we spoke about IMAP. IMAP, I, as I told you, is similar to the POP, but it gives additional features like you can uh, browse which mails you want to download or which mails you want to delete, or you can search for different mails in your mailbox by using search keywords. And then we spoke about MIME. MIME is basically used when you want to compose your message in probably any other language other than English uh, and use different character sets. It also allows us to uh, uh, include uh, non-textual information such as audio and video. 
and multimedia files and uh, the mime software the mime protocol basically encodes everything into a format that is understood by smtp and then it sends it across to the network and on the recipient side also you have mime which decodes this particular uh, file that you have sent and can actually be read by the recipient okay so we are at the end of the session if there are any questions